Welcome to the Business of E-Commerce, the show that helps e-commerce retailers start, launch, and grow the e-commerce business. I'm your host, Charles Plusky, and I'm here today alone. Today's actually a very special episode. It is episode 100. So first, I'd like to thank everyone for watching the past 90 episodes. If you've watched in the beginning, um, some people have emailed me and said that. That is amazing. Or if you've just kind of come on in the past few weeks, still amazing. Thank you so much for that. What I want to do for this episode to celebrate past 90 episodes we've done is make a mashup of different interviews with different guests, things they've said, kind of highlight some tips that we've had some great guests on here. So I wanted to kind of really bring that out and do some quick little clips jumping from different guests and just some different things that even I looked back and forgot it was so long ago, you know, hey, wow, that was great. So going back to these past 99 clips was awesome. So thank you to you, the viewer, you, the listener, and I hope you enjoy this episode. So on to the show. So kind of for starters, when you first start talking to a client, what are some things you look at? Um, new client? Uh, well, the first thing is always to take a look at their site or their app, you know, to get a, get a listing for that and make sure you understand exactly what it is, um, you know, that they're doing and then talk to them sort of globally about, you know, what their goals are, what their original goals were, how they've evolved because after a few years, you know, people can, can swerve one way or the other. So the logistics process hasn't changed much. At the end of the day, you know, to make cookies and ship them out, there's only so many ways to do that. But the rest of the business, what we found is to focus on the things that we like and we're good at. So I like to write. Uh, I like to think I'm pretty good at it. So I'll take, take care of writing the blog every day. And then Lee is an artist. So she kind of runs the graphic overwatch on the whole thing. And make sure that the direction, as far as the look of Paleo Treats, is going where she wants it. Usually, in, in terms of low-hanging fruit, there's going to be some major opportunities that we're going to look at. But first, we're going to look at how much traffic the site gets. Because when, when you're talking about A-B testing, you want to focus your efforts where it's going to have the biggest impact. And when we're looking at where we're going to have the biggest impact, it's usually the pages or areas where you're going to get the most traffic. I think... Um Really, any kind of e-commerce business can can have some level of benefit from having a podcast that supports their products and services. There's a couple of different ways you can look at it. You can look at it from a, almost like a customer support um, kind of show to a show talking and featuring um, various products or services that are offered on your your you know in your business. I think it's really important to go through an extensive discovery period. Um, really identify what the main objectives of making the e-commerce site are. So some people, some brands, especially in fashion and beauty, they really want to make an immersive site that tells the brand story. So that type of site is definitely different in comparison to an e-commerce site that really is just purely focused on conversion. So identifying what your main objectives are, I think is cornerstone to this process. You know, when, when I talk about getting financing, or I refer to it as capital, basically any kind of money you can get as a business, there's a couple of different avenues you really want to focus on. You know, one is the business credit, the corporate credit side, which really has to do with credit cards, right? Visa cards, MasterCards, American Express, Dell, Apple, et cetera. And then I look at the other side of it as the business financing, everything that's left. These are loans and these are credit lines that are through alternative lenders and SBA, et cetera. Um, so there's a couple different avenues you can go. The problem is, is that loans and lines and those, a lot of people know the difficulties, especially in e-commerce, of getting approved with a lot of those because a lot of the industries that we're in, in e-commerce, even where I am, financial services, is considered to be high risk. And if you're out there doing your own Facebook ads and, and you're trying to do new product research and you're uploading things to the website and you're dealing with the customer experience and you're dealing with returns and exchanges and all those kinds of things, it can be just a little bit overwhelming to think there's probably some extra things I could be doing to make more money, to increase the customer experience. And I am so passionate about trying to give people a customer experience, especially when it comes to online, because that's the thing you have to fight against bricks and mortar. So uh, through a couple of job transitions, I uh, had uh, on a fluke bought uh, the domain name whatismyipaddress.com. I was wow. doing some IT stuff, and I needed to know what my IP address was at the office, and I should do something with it, yep. which, which led to the challenge of, okay, how do you monetize someone looking for their IP address? 
doing some research and finding out that there were companies that, gosh, I would just put a little code on my website and, and they'll put a banner on a banner ad on there for me and, and pay me a percentage. I don't have to find people to advertise on the site. And uh, this is, this is easy peasy. I, my honest opinion is if you can go with a, uh, an off the shelf, like Shopify or BigCommerce, and you can be satisfied with that, then do it. I, I definitely think if those platforms fit for you, then there's no need because custom is is going to typically going to be more expensive. There's sometimes like you can get more expensive than Shopify and especially in the Shopify plus on the, the monthly recurring and, and all that stuff, kind of these fees that you pay over time. So, I mean, you could weigh those costs um, depending on that, but I, I definitely encourage people even like thinking non e-commerce, like people who just need websites and they feel like they need some big, awesome custom marketing site, like yep. try it in Squarespace first. You know, yep. if it if it works in Squarespace, then why 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 fix that? Why spend more money if you don't have to? So I'm all about being lean. Boston, surprisingly, like it, it's not as uh, robust for lots of e-commerce firms compared to well compared to New York. You know, a lot like a lot of locally, our com- competitors are mostly in New York. Hmm. There's like so many of them there, but Boston's not quite as not quite as many here. Well, the first thing you need to understand is exactly what sort of tax you're dealing with. So we've got income tax, which is an e-commerce retailer at the end of the year makes $100,000, how much tax do they owe the IRS? That's one entire funnel of tax issues. Then there's an entirely different funnel, which tax professionals call, call SALT, state and local taxes. And this is local income taxes, but also local sales taxes. And there really is a lot more going on in the SALT arena for e-commerce retailers simply because there's there's developing consensus on what should be subject to sales tax what should not be subject to sales tax you know 15 years ago amazon got their start largely by avoiding state level sales taxes that was their uh their big uh a uh, big competitive advantage. When I first started with e-commerce, it was in 2007, and I actually started with importing because I didn't know dropshipping was a thing, and I was using Alibaba back then. So that, you know, for as long as I've known about this, has been around. The AliExpress I started hearing about, I want to say five plus years ago, but recently, I would say in the past two years, is when it became almost a trendy thing. Like there's yeah. probably dozens of YouTube channels now, you know, where you see all these Shopify screenshots and it's all Overlow, AliExpress, dropship from China, and uh, that's just what people naturally think in their head now when they when they hear the term dropshipping. So people come to your site, they're looking around, they're really excited, maybe they add some stuff to your cart, and then they get distracted. They walk away. Maybe they're not sure. Whatever it is, they find some reason that they're not going to complete the purchase and they leave all their stuff in the cart and they just close the browser tab or walk away from their computer or close their mobile device, whatever it is. And that basically is an abandoned cart. And unfortunately, abandoned carts are a huge, huge problem in e-commerce. Well, I I have many opinions there, (laughs) but basically to me, it comes down to what's the right fit for you and your company. Yep. Um, I mean, if you're, I mean, it does really comes down to that, and it really is such a unique fit that it's not a blanket answer that you can give anyone. <laughs> so, um, I mean, I've seen that question come up in the Quora forum, the yep. Quora questions, whatever you want to call that, and everything so often that I, I often wonder, you know, how could I answer this and and. I don't know. I end up not answering those questions for people unless it's like a specific call one-on-one because, I mean, you could use, I mean, a general, a start, person starting out could use a Shopify store or they could use a Magento store, and it really all depends on what your overall goals are yep. as a business. Yeah, I think food and clothing do really well on Instagram, yeah. right? Like, I, I do most of my clothing shopping from Instagram ads. <laughs> I will tell you that I find out about new brands. Um, I would say, like, some probably struggle, depending on what the brand is, but there's a great opportunity to have a different voice on Instagram. And I also think there's a little bit of a more positive attitude on Instagram than sometimes you see, like, than Twitter or Facebook. But I see a lot of sellers giving each other advice and giving each other bad advice based on their idea of how it works inside the company. and. I would say maybe 75% of the time when I'm reading sellers communicating with each other on how this stuff works, I see wrong and and mistaken information. And that's why you have to talk to people. It doesn't have to be me, but you have to talk to somebody who knows 
what's true and what isn't. I find that social media marketing is super, super popular. Everybody wants to know how to use online to generate and grow their business. What we do is we try and keep it really simple. Um, There's a lot of competitors out there. There's a lot of other people that they tell you how to set up like a 20 step sales funnel and you have to do all this stuff before you even get started on making money. Well, we kind of take the opposite approach. I exclusively work on Shopify. I niched down to Shopify years ago and having that laser focus has been really a, a rocket ship ride for us. You know, certainly we we hitched our cart to the right horse, but having that that crispy laser focus positioning where people just go, oh, you can now like they just tie it together in their brain and go, oh, you're the Shopify guy. Yep. And I say that would be like my first tip is man, focus on your positioning, work on your positioning statement. Uh, first off, we'll go with the beginners and the more advanced people. But for beginners, um, you know, the biggest tips in terms of setting up your account correctly and then scaling it in the future is one naming convention is huge. So one thing that a lot of people don't sort of get uh, the first time round is organization and naming convention uh, because overlap in your audiences, campaigns, target audience, that sort of stuff is a huge issue within accounts. And so if you don't have the correct naming conventions, you don't exactly know what you're running and where, and that can lead to a lot of overlap or it can lead to you uh, retesting audiences you've already tested. So number one takeaway is definitely uh, naming convention. Uh, You definitely need to have a system that you follow throughout your entire sort of account. So this, the, the long and the short of it is, is, you know, just like a collar stay keeps the collar looking straight, million dollar collar actually goes down this part of the shirt. So when you wear a shirt without a tie, it'll never crumble, it'll never fold, it'll just give you that nice V so that, you know, when you're wearing a dress shirt, you always look good. To me, I, I, I like to wear V-necks and T-shirts and hang out, but when I put on a dress shirt, I, I it's because I want to look important or I want to dress up or, uh, you know, I just don't want to look sloppy. So when I got married and my shirt looked like this all day, uh, it really drove me nuts. And I just remember tugging and tugging and tugging and it just wouldn't sit the way I wanted. And then that's because there's no reinforcement down this part of the shirt. So um, that's basically what it is. It's just a little strip. It looks like this. So one goes into each side, it gets sewn into your shirt, and once it's in, it lasts the life of the shirt. The first part of what you just asked me was, let's say you're a retailer. So that's a big red flag right there, right? If you're an e-tailer versus a retailer, the the landscape of retail is is completely changing. And so um, one of the things that I look at is what's really going to keep you up at night, and are you having that honest conversation with yourself? There's a very famous proverb that fear and courage are brothers, that you actually can't get to the courageous choice without first channeling it through fear. But what I've found is that most companies, they suppress fear versus address fear. So after kind of riding this wave up and down, up and down in the wholesale uh, market, I decided after reading a book uh, that I came across called The New Rules of Retail by Robin Lewis, uh, who's a sort of a retail master out of New York, um, where basically the book talked about how retail started out with catalogs at Sears and Roebuck, which was an ex- which was a, a big change from the general stores where you, know, you, you could only go to a store and buy what they had there to Sears Roebuck, where all of a sudden now you got a catalog delivered to your house and they'd ship stuff to you. And then how that changed into the department store. And then the department store changed into the specialty store. And then by the mid 2000s, uh, the need for for actual wholesale and retailers was going away because brands could start to go direct to the consumer through their own e-commerce. So I'm I'm not one to tell somebody that their business model is not going to work. I recognize that there are people that understand how to do, for example, retail arbitrage and do that very very well. And there are companies that know how to identify other people's brands and negotiate good arrangements with those brands so that they can be the resellers. There are companies that do private label brands that actually know how to launch products very, very well on Amazon. That being said, there are lots that try to make their own brands and have absolutely no idea how to do it well. So the the reality is all these models can work. The challenge is you have to recognize you need different skills, 
and different processes to be able to make each of the models work. So even when I got into retail arbitrage, when I learned about that business model, I at the same time began to research other business models. But I knew I didn't really have I knew I didn't have the cash to really go into wholesale or private label at the time. But I knew of it. So I was listening to podcasts and I was starting to, starting to learn about it. And then I moved into wholesale because I thought, okay, well, I can't keep doing retail arbitrage because it's burning me out. Like physically, I'm getting four hours, three hours sleep a night on average. And that's just not good enough to to have a human life. So I parked that and I stopped doing retail arbitrage completely. And then I moved over to wholesale. So the thing with private label is uh, your product, you're, you're making a bet that you're going to be smart enough to choose a product that has enough demand but not too much competition and then you invest you know you get you you get your samples and you get your name you get your be your big order and it gets shipped here and so forth and so there's a lot of money that gets sunk in up front and if you get it wrong if you pick like in my case uh, uh one of the products that i invested the most money in was a shock collar for dogs because i wanted to get into it i wasn't afraid of spending money on advertising but i totally un- underestimated uh, the amount of black hat that goes on uh, with false reviews and so forth, because back then you could still game the system. And so I was just spending and spending and spending on promotions and pay-per-click to try and get my sales rank and my product to get to the point where, you know, it would sell well enough. And it wasn't the only product I had. I had some essential oil diffuser necklaces as well. But both of the product selections that I made weren't really that good. Um, and so, you know, four or five months in, I'm still not making any profit and I was really, really frustrated and uh, just didn't really want to do it anymore. Yeah, I'll give you kind of the the quick story behind Best Day of My Life and how it started. So back in 2014, uh, my best buddies and I figured it'd be a cool idea to get into business together. We started saying just kind of tongue in cheek. I asked one of my buddies how his day was and at one point he's like, hey, best day of my life. Just kind of being a smart aleck, right? And we started saying it, started kind of catching on, you know, you kind of talk how your friends talk. And my girlfriend at the time ended up making us t-shirts that said best day of my life on them. And uh, we just th- kind of thought it was funny. So we just wore them around. And the response from people was just overwhelmingly positive and interactive. And it was just such a conversation piece. Uh, people come up and ask, well, hey, is it really the best day of your life? Why is it the best day of your life? You know, hey, because I'm here, because I'm breathing, or because this is good, because I'm great. It just it was an amazing way to, to meet people and, and just have organic conversations with strangers that normally wouldn't happen. And so we started wearing these shirts around and, you know, what, ha- what ended up happening for me as an entrepreneur is people started asking, where can I get one? Where can I buy one of those shirts? Like, how do I get my hands on one? And so we figured, all right, let's look up the trademark, right? Figuring there's no way best day of my life's available as a trademark, right? Somebody has to have that domain. Somebody has to have the trademark. And sure enough, on GoDaddy, nobody owned bestdayofmylife.com. No, nobody nobody, owned, owned, nobody owned that. We bought it for $40, I am which shocked. is insane. You know, when we started go, selling FBA, it really helps the ability to scale the business because, you know, if you have the right product, and I'm sure we'll talk some more about this stuff, but just the ability, if you, know, if you get some things right, a big part of it in terms of how to actually source and execute is was handled for you. And it, it helps a ton. Just, you know, Amazon has all these uh, criteria and things you have to do right as a seller to maintain certain status as a, as a seller. And the nice thing when Amazon FBA, when they're handling so much of it, you're pretty much assured that your, your seller stats can be really good in all those areas because Amazon, which is fantastic in making sure they fulfill all the orders. If you, uh, let's start with the worst end of the scenario of things. If you just, if you get interested in the Amazon thing, because it's still a big opportunity that everyone hears about famously from various different podcasts and all angles of the internet, if you like. A lot of people come to me having said that I've listened to, you know, about 50 episodes of different podcast episodes from different people. And sometimes they come, they say I've listened to like 200 of the episodes that I've produced, 275 episodes on now. And they've watched a lot of YouTube videos and like quite unsurprisingly, their brain is mush. And that's an example of how not to do it, I think. Um, If you're starting out, I think it's great to take a structured course. I want to be very clear that I, I think that does work. That's what I've done. That's what a lot of my successful friends have done. And I think it does cut your learning time and you can model what works. I always say to break it down into three different levels of hires. The first is basic, then you got mid, and then you got expert. 
So for a basic level freelancer or virtual assistant, this is when you think of outsourcing. Non-US, five to $10 an hour. They might have years of experience, but they're followers. They're there to follow your system, your process. And then you got the mid-level. The mid-level, they're specialists. They do the same thing eight to 10 hours every day. They're graphic designers, they're bookkeepers. They write Amazon product listings. You're not teaching them how to be a graphic designer, although you can tweak what they do to fit your needs, but they're not consulting with you either. They're doers. And then you got the experts, the 25 and up. They can consult, they can project manage, they can execute high level game plans. Um, they can bring their own expertise to the table. So with that in mind, you have to figure out, do I need a follower, do I need a doer, or do I need an expert? I had been working as a, as a chef and I kind of burned out on that after 17 years and wanted to have more flexibility with my time, which is pretty much the story of most people that start their own e-commerce business. And um, I was trying to decide really what type of e-commerce business to start. And I, I had a, a side interest or just sort of a side dream of, you know, wanting to have a, a little cabin in the woods someday. And so that, that type of decor appealed to me. And I just decided, you know, that's what I'll do. I'll start with, um, you know, sort of cabin, cabin furnishings. And it, initially when I started, I wasn't just working only with artisans and handcrafted items. I had things that um, lamps and different kinds of things that, you know, actually had standard UPC codes and that you could buy other places. And then after a while, it morphed into working with um, just artisans. And I ended up, I decided to eliminate anything that you could literally put in an item number on Google and find that item at, you know, several different sources. Oh yeah. I mean, I think, um, two things, obviously the first is, you know, you get the cushion of, you know, salary and benefits. So even if you lose, you know, of course I went into the, the business knowing that, Hey, I might lose a couple thousand dollars. I really tried to approach it very leanly. Like I was never like, okay, cool. Like, let me take my whole salary and invest in starting up this business. I approached it with the mindset of, Hey, okay, if I'm going to launch at the farmer's market, like my first step is just purely to validate the product. Like I want to know that other people are going to like want, crave and repeatedly buy my product. And it's not just, okay, great. This is good, but I would never buy it. So I wanted to test that as quickly as possible. And I figured the farmer's market was the, the easiest way to access that immediate feedback. Um, and I went in like prepared to lose maybe up to a thousand, two thousand dollars just based off like buying your LLC, you know, setting up a basic website, you know, booth stuff, you know, filing for my trademark. Sure. The, the, the goal is to do two things, to increase your conversion rate on the checkout and then to increase your average order value on with post-purchase upsells. So what we do is we allow, uh, we allow merchants to have a checkout page that's completely in their control. So Shopify is a fantastic platform and their checkout is, is good too, but it is limiting in the amount of flexibility that merchants have to add trust symbols, to add uh, images, testimonials to test things out, different button colors and so on. Uh, and then the other thing we do is we take that three page Shopify checkout and we put it all on one page. The metrics we look for are amount of unique visitors to a site on a monthly basis because we need enough traffic to run AB or multivariate testing on the site. So uh, generally we want to see more than 10 to 12,000 unique visitors per month to a site as a bare minimum uh, before you can truly focus on AB testing. The way that we like to define conversion rate optimization is the improving of any metric that uh, we are looking to grow uh, that would ultimately lead to additional revenue for the e-comm site. You know, I have learned along the way um, the best methods to uh, grow a aggressively in e-commerce. And it's, it's a growing market. I mean, we all know that it's uh, the growing piece of any given industry. Um, but it does take quite a discipline to be able to grow at triple digit growth and still sustain profitability. Uh, the retailers have been pressured mostly realistically by Amazon to develop their e-commerce business in the mid 2000s and through today. And they're still building, but they've got uh, quite a foundation developed. 
Now what I'm actually involved with is other industries, whether it's manufacturers, there's a big conversation out there today with direct to consumer, how manufacturers can go directly to the consumer rather than wholesale to the retailers, and then other industries such as financial and services. I can remember when I decided to quit my job, it was really during the financial crisis of 2008. And it was the day the dollar broke. And it, for me, it was like I lost my religion. I didn't know what anything was anymore. And I started thinking, you know, the only safe thing today is potatoes. And I'd had this dream since I was 18 years old of being able to create this shoe. And I ended up just talking to people about it, nonstop talking. And everyone's like, you know, honestly, that's a good idea. You sound very passionate about it. Well, why don't you do it? So by... January, I was able to leave my company. And by February, I started working part time or sorry, full time on looking for a solution. I'm using the skill set I have, which is mergers, acquisitions, buying intellectual property. So I try to buy a company that looked like they had interesting technology in the United States. So they were in a chapter 11 situation. The technology tested very badly here in France. People were comparing the shoes to dead donkeys, which, you know, that's a hard sell. So <laughs> you, you don't want to be selling the dead donkey shoes. No, you really don't. You really don't. So nine months later, I figured there was nothing out there that I could buy and improve. So I started working with engineers here in Paris and we started working on our own approach. So I'd, I'd heard of some people and basically they were trying to get you to buy products and giving you discount codes and realizing that that would drive sales. So thinking it through, I was like, okay, let's build up an email list and let's send that email list coupon codes. But rather than just sending them links, I'm gonna tell them what to search for. I'm gonna tell them what page it's gonna be on and then have them go through that. So I'd build up a list, have them do that. And suddenly I have X number of people the first day the product launches searching for the exact perfect keywords and buying that product. You would kind of shoot up the ranking. So I had products with one review that was like, top three product in a very competitive space. And it was working really well. And all of this was all of this was gray hat at the time. Technically, Amazon has in their terms of service, you're not allowed to do anything whatsoever that remotely gives you an advantage or tries to help you sell your product. So it was kind of something where Amazon sellers were like, OK, this is a joke. We don't care. So we're going to try. And that's what I did. I, I was also pretty decent at copywriting and uh, marketing and advertising as well. So using Amazon's Amazon's PPC engine is the best PPC engine in the world. So dealing with that and really pouring money into things that were either, they didn't have to be profitable. They just had to get us ranking and get us selling well enough where the losses from PPC could kind of eat those. And then the gains from organic sales more than made up for it. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of myths. It's it's a weird space. You know, Google's algorithm is a black box because the more people know about it, then the more people try to manipulate it. And, you know, that's what Google's been battling for the last two decades is all kinds of spam and people trying to manipulate the rankings. In terms of SEO being dead or alive, SEO is very much alive. Uh, if you have a website uh, and you look over the last several years of how much traffic it's getting, um, you know, unless, of course, you know, I don't know, there was like a penalty or some other change to the site. Um, I've seen, you know, the the traffic and the, the amount of search volume to Google uh, basically continue to grow over time. The change has been that Google is starting to give answers in the search results page itself, which means that not as frequently will be, people be clicking on those search results and becoming traffic to your website. Um, so that's been posing a challenge, uh, certainly going forward for people that have been using SEO to get traffic to their website. Uh, and then you have things like voice search, which is at the time of our recording now, it's still very early. Um, but maybe two, three, four years from now, uh, things might pick up where people are searching by voice, not by, you know, on their, let's say like typing on their mobile phone or on their desktops so rather than visiting a website. Uh, th so things are definitely evolving. You could easily inflate growth by running some paid ads and getting traffic to the site. So you have that pretty graph that goes up and to the right. Um, for gro whenever I'm thinking of growth um, with e-commerce companies, usually I'm thinking of something that's you know sustainable um, and repeatable. So you, you found a channel for getting quality traffic. Um, and that could be a free channel or maybe it's a paid channel, but it's an ROI positive paid channel. Um, and the traffic that's coming in, you can actually convert that traffic into customers um, at a reasonable conversion rate. So usually with e-commerce sites, you know, that's over 2% if you're selling products between 50 to 300 bucks. Um, and 
unless you're in the acquisition game, um, you actually also have good retention. So you're able to get good repeat purchases in under, say, 90 days. Uh, Scale Excel is my newest venture. I've been uh, doing e-commerce consulting for, I guess, about 10 years now. Uh, I started because I was a broke college student. I ended up failing out of school and I needed to uh, find a new way to replace my scholarship. I got five younger brothers and my parents said, it's a great idea if you go to school, but we can't pay for it. So you, uh, you're you going to need to figure something out. And I said, man, what can I do? And I'd done a little bit of web design in high school and somehow stumbled my way into digital marketing uh, and started off as a copywriter. So then one thing led to another, ended up founding a company with some guys and uh, realized that there's just a huge market in direct consumer uh, e-commerce offering. So I said, man, I'm going to keep doing this. Uh, took a year off and, and did a year of mission in Chile. I'm Catholic and uh, came back and de- decided to get back in the game, did some more consulting for a, a survival product company. Uh, and now I'm looking to acquire some companies as well as offer a, a little bit of individualized consulting. A lot of people that host WordPress sites have fundamentally made sure their site runs fast by caching everything, right? By turning it into basically an HTML site uh, via cache. And that doesn't work for applications, right? If you're running a membership site, a course, any kind of LMS, and if you're running an e-commerce store, right, you can't just go to one of those other hosts and say, hey, run my store because their infrastructure is suited towards WordPress, not necessarily WooCommerce. And that's when people start feeling that pain. They call in, hey, I'm having trouble. This isn't working right. And that's why we created Manage WooCommerce Hosting, right? So that you could basically call in and say, oh, I have this problem. And they go, yeah, I understand exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, right off the bat, I would say if they're working with, you know, trading companies or agents or wholesalers, you know, you always want to go direct to factory, especially at scale. So that's really kind of the first analysis that we do. Secondly is understanding, you know, where they're manufacturing. Right now, China's actually become one of the more expensive areas of the world to produce products. And so a lot of times we're diversifying uh, production outside of China into, you know, India, Vietnam, Thailand, Pakistan, the Philippines, um, you name it. Um, and so really, you know, diversification is another, you know, big kind of step that we make. And then, you know, number two is just actually from their team standpoint, you know, really making sure that they have the right tools in place, which, you know, is why we developed our software to enable them to, you know, have complete oversight and control of production and understand what's you know going on each step of the way. Yeah, I mean, imagine I like to uh, tell my clients and, and people I'm talking to, like friends and marketers, it's like, imagine if Facebook just disappeared overnight, like how would that impact your business? And so many of these companies are doing 90, 95, 99 percent of their sales from Facebook, um, which is great. Like Facebook's killing it. But um, it's just like you said, it's it's tough being at the mercy of that platform. Historically, everyone uh, in e-commerce really knows us for email capture. So you come to Privy, you easily design and target things like exit intent pop-ups or spin wheels or flyouts that take the site traffic you have, offer an incentive in exchange for an email list subscription, and then we would plug that into MailChimp or Klaviyo or whoever you use. Um, as we've grown within the space, we had a lot of customers that said, hey, we like your support, we like how easy it is to use your product and how tightly integrated it is for e-commerce. Um, so they actually started asking us for email marketing tools specifically. And our first use case around email marketing that's going very well uh, really ties the concept of the data we see on your website and emails together in a way that helps us run cart abandonment emails like no one else can. And I'm happy to kind of walk through that too. Definitely. SEO can be hard for e-commerce sites. Um, E-commerce sites tend to tend to have issues like getting links, like and getting if you're reaching out to influencers, a lot of influencers are are pay to play nowadays. So so that can can get difficult. I remember that statistic when we first started. We were like, are we going to make it past that five year mark and you know things like that. Um, And I think customer service is probably the single biggest reason why. You know, um, 
I, I pin it down to there's a lot of other companies out there that make products similar to me. Uh, you know, I belong to a business group where, you know, I would vouch for their products almost as much as I would vouch for mine because we all sort of follow the same principles. So there is a reason that my customers are going to come back to Scrub and that's going to be the way they're treated here. Yeah. So, I mean, we, in the last 19 years, uh, you know, in terms of educating our consumer and prospecting and trying to, you know, it's funny, I use words like words like prospecting uh, roll off of my tongue now. But when it was, you know, 1999, we're just trying to figure it out. You know, prospecting wasn't a a marketing term that I that I was familiar with at the time. Uh, And and now it is. Uh, So, you know, we moved from we moved from print ads to uh, to working with uh, other digital outlets as they came 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 on board. I mean, we were we were online selling before Google AdWords was a thing. The biggest thing that I tell people, um, especially since I also work with other brands doing consulting, because a lot of people just end up finding me and I like to talk business. So um, that's where we're part physical product, part digital media, and now part agency as well. Um, a lot of people, I think, they also get that. Uh, uh, conception about content marketing that it only has to be written. Oh, I might not be a great writer or, you know, it only has to be Instagram. Oh, I don't really take photos that well. You just have to really pick one uh, modality and then you just go for it. So in the beginning, I only did YouTube um, before anything else, before social media, all I really did was YouTube videos and um, video was where everything got started. So, and uh, of course, you know, video tends to be a really big sales converter, you know, by itself. So if you can do video, then great. But if you are not comfortable with video yet, go with the writing, go with the blogging. Sure. So I, I think um, you begin to see marketing automation come into play, um, especially on a retail front um, as an adjunct to uh, your e-commerce platform. So you know, when uh, somebody makes a purchase or puts something into their cart, but maybe doesn't complete the purchase, these marketing automation platforms are getting really good at kind of having triggers set up where you can notify the marketing automation platform that so-and-so has taken this action, but maybe they haven't completed the purchase or they haven't, you know, finished the conversion that we might like them to. And it's at that point that you can use the marketing automation platform to take over and, you know, send them um, abandoned cart notifications, offers for uh, upgrade or coupon or, or something like that. So we started with you know, cart abandonment. So we've got that pre-purchase suite of emails, uh, you know, where we capture emails earlier in the process, in the shopping process. Like you can capture emails when someone adds something to the cart, for example, uh, or when they reach the checkout page. Um, And we'll send like recovery emails for those, which we find are fantastic revenue generators for a lot of stores, right? We'll send um, purchase confirmation emails. So like your your order status emails, um, like receipts, shipment confirmations, um, cancellation notices, right? Uh, And then also a lot of post-purchase emails. So we see a huge variety of emails people send, uh, usually things like asking for a product review, sending an educational series strip for particular products, right? Uh, We see that a lot with membership sites, um, you know, where they send like kind of an intro to your membership thing. Um, We see people using win-back emails for lapsed customers, replenishment reminders, if you sell something that's consumable and people are typically, you know, repurchasing that uh, welcome series for first time purchasers or uh, repeat purchasers, right. To kind of thank them for their loyalty or to send discounts for their next purchase. So I'm, I'm not one to tell somebody that their business model is not going to work. I recognize that there are people that understand how to do, for example, retail arbitrage and do that very, very well. And there are companies that know how to identify other people's brands and negotiate good arrangements with those brands so that they can be the resellers. There are companies that do private label brands that actually know how to launch products very, very well on Amazon. That being said, there are lots that try to make their own brands and have absolutely no idea how to do it well. So the the reality is all these models can work. The challenge is you have to recognize you need different skills different processes to be able to make each of the models work. I kind of like to start a little bit before that. I normally come into clients when they're working through the design and the development. A lot of times people are like ready to, you know, make changes in their business, get more clients, and they start with, you know, maybe a design update or a development update. And that's kind of where I like to come in to make sure that it's designed with SEO in mind, that it's not simply designed to to look amazing or to 
put the products or the services, you know, most beautifully on the site, but I want to make sure that it, it is designed with SEO in mind. For backlinks, especially when it comes to e-commerce, um, there's no quick solutions other than to build a brand. So we found the ones that focus on brand building naturally build up the most backlinks over time. Uh, you can also create press and do product launches. We felt that works really well with e-commerce. If you're just selling, you know, shoelaces and shoes that everyone else has, that's fine. But if you're releasing a new pair of kicks that no one's ever seen before, creating an event around it, launching them, or a whole line, kind of like what Apple does, but for your e-commerce products, it's a great way to get press, people covering it, backlinks, and that all does help with rankings in the long run. Yeah, that's that's one very popular thing. And then, and then the other side of it that tends to work really well with e-commerce, in some cases it works much better, is actually to give your customer a, a way to get their friends a discount. So there, a lot of times they're different from affiliates in that they're more interested in hooking their friends up with a good deal than they are in like earning, you know, a gift card or a discount on their next purchase. And so I think every, every store owner should test those things and figure out which one works for their customer base and their product. That's what Kickstarter is about. That's why people are giving you, I was just meeting with a new bookkeeper uh, yesterday and explaining to him, Hey, you know, I do a lot of pre-sales on a lot of Kickstarter and there's some accounting things. So we have to keep in track on that because we got money coming in. That's like not actually being recognized as revenue for six months later when we ship out the product. And he's like, so they just give you their money and then don't get anything for a year later. I'm like, yeah, I don't, it's crazy if you say it that way, but, and, but that's, like what you're selling is the product, but you're also selling, you're bringing them on the journey, right? And that's where you you get these people who are excited about the process who you're going to bring along. So, you know, if you are obviously in a, in a competitive e-commerce landscape, you need to monitor all the actions of your competitors, including their pricing decisions. So, and on top of that, you need to come up with competitive and profitable pricing decisions. So we help e-commerce retailers from all around the world to really satisfy that in an automated way. And we do this in actually three steps. So we initially help those e-commerce companies to automatically identify all their competitor listings. So let's say they are selling product A. So we automatically identify all the listings for this product A on, let's say, tens of e-commerce companies out there. And with that matching, let's say, landscape, we then focus on tracking all the prices of those products on, all, on those tens of different channels in an automated way with our price monitoring module. So we have an automated price monitoring for benchmarking all the prices over the competitors. And then we deliver all this, let's say, fresh and updated data in a web dashboard. We send email alerts. We send Excel reports. Okay, so I think, you know, for e-commerce especially, I would look at product name, um, I think that that's very important for branding um, and for just, you know, leaving a lasting impression with your customers. Um, I would also test your main product photo because that's going to have a huge impact on your click through rates. Um, and, you know, just sort of the appeal that your product has, the uh, the, the impression that it leaves uh, uh, with customers. And then I would look very carefully at the language in your product description. So those would be my top three for an e-commerce listing? Yeah, so we have, uh, at Omniscient, we, we define like five key steps of, of a customer journey. So our first one is even before having a contact. So it's anonymous anonymous visitor to your website, to your online store. Uh, so uh, with that visitor, the first goal in the first stage is to convert a uh, visitor into subscriber, uh, to, to convert into subscriber. So this is a second uh, stage, like, becoming a subscriber. And what's talking about subscriber, what's very important, that usually we do understand subscriber as an email subscriber, leaving an email address and obtaining for newsletters. But uh, but uh, what we advocate for is really that this uh, definition should be expanded. So subscriber is the one who obtains to email list, the one who uh, gives the permission to communicate via Facebook Messenger, which uh, allows you to send push notifications all or text messages, MMSs. So all of those are subscribers because you get the permission from a person to communicate like with uh, a customer. You know, we serve any customer who, who understands what our mission is about, 
Uh, our mission is to make men look and feel awesome. And it's like through that, that awesomeness that they can derive their confidence to take on the world and ultimately make the, the world a better place. So I don't care what you look like. I don't care what you dress like. If you, if you are that Harley guy, or if you're that musician, or if you're that woodsman and you identify with the brand, you know, it's a, it's a big open camp. Like we're not, we're not an exclusionary type of company, but at the same time, you know, like these are our roots of our companies. Like this is, this is where we came from. And, and we believe that, you know, a, a well-groomed beard is completely different than, you know, a beard that, that you'd see like a homeless guy wear or someone who just doesn't take care of it. And it can really add like a, a lot of effect and a lot of, uh, it can bring attention to you, which puts you in a position of power and leadership where you can utilize like a well-groomed beard as, you know, really like a leader in your community. With e-commerce, learning is such a huge part of this game because we're now in this accelerated transformative curve where, you know, we have our playbook and then a year later, it's, it's as if that playbook is not as effective anymore. So, you know, how do you, so you know, everything's going to change, you know, so how do you do that trend spotting and learning so that you're not surprised? Cause I think as a, as an e-commerce company, I hate surprises. I, I want to, you know, you don't have to be the first person, but you just want to be on that first wave of people that becomes aware of these shifts in strategy and trends. So that's how I got more interested in learning because I've I've been in the industry for 20 years. And a lot I hear a lot of, of sellers that will say, well, I go to Bed Bath & Beyond or I go to Target or something like that. And I see that they're using canned copy. Yes but they don't have to depend on the power and the uh, the boost that original copy brings them because they have devoted shoppers, they're huge sites, they have a huge list they can mail to and drive traffic to a site any given time. They're sending out mass mailings in newspapers every Sunday about the sales that they're having and they're driving traffic in a lot of other ways that a brand new e-commerce site or even a small established site might not be doing. So the dependency on what copy can bring is going to be even more important for medium to smaller sites than it would be for great big giant e-tailers. Correct. So there are multiple ways in which fraudsters obviously can affect uh, a business or an online business, right? So, and, and one of the most important of them in terms of um, how much it affects the bottom line is what we call a uh, uh, chargebacks, which are the transactions that you accepted in your website, usually with uh, card, uh, credit cards, and they, um, the, the actual cardholder will say that the, the, he or she doesn't recognize the transaction, and then he or she will ask for a reimbursement, the cardholder, and then the, bank, the issuer bank will give the money back to this person, and then this liability, this financial liability when it comes to card not present transactions, are, uh, the liability is on the merchant's shoulders, right? So, which means that, let's say, you sold $100,000 in a given month, eventually two or three of these transactions will get back to you as chargebacks, and then you have to pay back your bank, and not, not a lot of your um, revenues can be really recognized. And on the other hand, you lose probably, you, you lost probably your, you know, the products you shipped or, or the services. To, so I work a lot with real estate agents and they all come to me because they see my YouTube channel and they're like, well, I want to do that because every real estate agent is really just a personal brand. So if they do it the right way, they can build a strong following on social media and use that to or leverage that to really generate more sales for the agency. The trouble is most agents come to me and they try to when they think YouTube, they're like, all right, well, I just want to put all my listings on my YouTube channel. I'm like, well, number one, have you ever in your life heard of anyone going to YouTube to look at a listing? No, because they're gone too quickly. YouTube is a long form content platform. So there, it's where stuff needs to, to last. It just needs to last a, a long amount of time where a listing is there and then it's gone, you know, the next day. So, and not to mention, no one's going to YouTube and searching home listings in Atlanta, Georgia, right? That's not where you go. You go to Google and then you uh, usually end up on like Zillow or Trulia, something like that, right? 
So you, you have to start to wrap your head around what content would people look for instead of what do I want to sell? The YouTube, the YouTube channel only you know, became a thing because you, uh, I'm a big, uh, I'm a big fan of that guy Gary Vaynerchuk, and if you've heard of him, he's a YouTube, you know, entrepreneur or whatever. And uh, I grew up in, I grew up in the town or town next to where where he grew up, uh, and I kind of grew up in his, you know, like entrepreneurship shadow. So you know, one day I, I got to meet him, and the great piece of advice that he gave me was to find the white space, right? Find what other people aren't doing in your space. You know, what's, yeah, you know, where can you fit in? Where can you capitalize? Others aren't playing, and do that. It took a little while. I didn't immediately say YouTube, um, but I, I knew that you know, other people around me, my dad being one, said, you know, maybe you're not the best on camera, meaning me, but you can start to practice and no one else in your business is doing it. No one else in your industry. So take a shot. You know, maybe you'll get better at it. In fact, you almost surely will. So I just took a shot. That was about six or eight months into the business. Uh, so YouTube was a, you know, was kind of an afterthought. For us, we, a lot of people are going to say a lot of different things when it comes to Amazon, right? A lot of people for a while, they got obsessed with Japan. Uh, people got obsessed, are now obsessed with Australia as, as at the time of recording. Uh, and the reality is that the two biggest markets on Amazon are the UK, US being number one. And then the European zone being number two, because because we have the EFN, so we're able to, to classify Europe as one place. So we always focus on, if you send an inventory over, I would send 50 to 60% of inventory to the US, the remainder to Europe. And, and that's what I would do to, to test, because they're similar size markets, so it kind of makes sense. Okay, so, now, so, depending, 50 to 60, so you'd split a base almost in half, basically, half to Europe, half almost to Almost in half. Yeah, almost, almost in half now because of, you know, the, the European markets have developed a lot more than years ago. We would have done maybe 70, 30 a few years ago in favor of the U.S., whereas that's kind of changing now. The European markets are getting bigger because there's five countries as a whole. But the thing you got to remember about the European markets as well, which is really cool, is that let's say you're selling your product in Germany. Well, people in Austria, they'll see your German listing because they typically shop on Amazon.de. Uh, so you're not really just selling to five countries, you're selling to the surrounding countries as well. Well, I think diversifying, I think any any business, and I, I, again, if you're just selling a product, you're not a business really. That That's my belief, right? If you're just selling a one-off product, a widget um, of some kind, you're not really a, you're not really a business in a sense because you're not a brand. You're not, you're not a, a business that someone can go in and, ball, and buy multiple products or everything is linked together or you have content that can actually help people. Like if you've ever seen any really successful brands, they always mix in content so they get traffic externally. They're dominating the search engines. They have an email list. They have a presence on social. Like all of these different things, they're communicating with the customer. That's a brand. Like look at Bulletproof, right? Bulletproof has content to help people live a healthier life, but they also sell products. People underestimate that when you're first getting started, the, the most important aspect is your own personal interest in the business, right? You are the engine that's going to drive this thing to the first, you know, $100,000 in revenue or, or whatever it is. And so keeping your own interest is really, really important. It's like a car engine that, you know, that, that needs to start. It needs to, it needs to be interested. And so I think the other thing to think about when you're doing this is like, even if the numbers all make sense, if you hate waking up on Saturday morning to work on this, you're going to have a very rough <laughs> road ahead of you. So I actually really like this idea of aligning your interest in working on this project first, like before all the numbers and before everything else, and then letting a lot of that momentum carry you towards it because it's just easier to figure it out, right? Like if you're having a problem with keywords in your title tags or your rankings or getting reviews or fixing a, a, a problem with the product in the factory, you find yourself naturally solving the problem if you love what you're doing. I know it's cliche, I know it's corny, but, um, and I know that not everyone does it that way. There's plenty of people working on big businesses with boring products, right? But I personally wasn't able to find myself able to wake up in the morning on Saturday morning and work on the product unless I was in love with it. So step one, most people want to skip past. Step one is getting your uh, content plan in place. So because Instagram is designed to be an on-the-go social media platform where for, for years it was impossible to post from anything except for your phone. Now they've kind of opened that up a little bit. But uh, because it's on-the-go, um, most people thought that they had to 
generate new content all the time, every single day. And there is a place for generating content, but if you're going to grow it, um, and you're going to grow it effectively, um, and systematically, uh, then your content has to be systematic as well. So the first thing that I always, um, explain to people is I, I basically break it down. You want, uh, five, five content categories. So five different styles of posts, and they could be anything from, um, memes. In fact, on my website, I publish a list of them, but memes, uh, you know, inspiration, uh, 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 customer testimonials. I'm specifically dealing with like e-commerce brands, testimonials, um, you know, lifestyle picks, whatever the, whatever the case is. So you want to choose your, your content categories and you want to post, um, I say no less than once a day. Um, like you said, uh, you really want to, um, you know, post as much as possible. Um, you could post one to three times a day. Uh, the reality of, of traffic on Amazon is that the, the lion's share of it moves through search and nowadays, uh, with Amazon's advertising and, and sponsored ads specifically, uh, pretty much everything above the fold is a paid placement. So the bulk of all clicks are paid placements. And, and Amazon's advertising units do have a, a very high click-through and conversion rate. So while there still is a, a significant amount of traffic that moves through you know, organic search, um, an increasingly large share is going through uh, paid, specifically uh, sponsored ads. Well, you have to learn to think different. You know, if the rat is always trapped in the rat maze uh, and never finds a way out or never decides to break free, uh, we'll just continually be chasing that cheese, uh, always one step behind. Uh, and, and unfortunately, yeah, uh, the, the entrepreneur is one of the best uh, sort of tributaries to go upstream financially in one's life to become an entrepreneur is I think one of the coolest and best ways that this, you know, this country is sort of left for, for uh, the average American. Uh, if you're smart and savvy enough to manage it, uh, you know, I mean, we do have a lot of trouble in our uh, big picture. I mean, we've got $1.5 trillion in student loan debt, you know, mortgages, credit cards that are going out of control. Uh, but I'd say one of the best things you can do is start a business. I mean, that's, that's a very old strategy. It's, it's old as, as, as old as the pyramids, really. If I had not started with retail arbitrage, if I had not started with online arbitrage, if I had not gone through all those processes, I wouldn't be where I am today, you know? Um, I just got started, and that's, that's the key, I think, is, is getting started. Doesn't matter what you do. Doesn't matter how you do it. Doesn't matter just... Just have a goal that, okay, buy X, I want to make X, right? Have a vision, but you don't need to know every single step of the way to get there. Because if you just sit there and, and dwell over, well, I think I should do this before this, and I think I should do that before this, and what if this happened here, and what if that doesn't work out this way, you're just never going to get started. Like literally every single successful entrepreneur I have interviewed or or you know, spoken to or, or, or seen, you know, been interviewed or something like that. They always say when I first got started, I didn't know how I was going to get there. I didn't have every, all the pieces in the right places. I just knew I wanted to go somewhere. And I knew if I don't do anything about it, nothing is going to change. And that's what I always tell people is that just start, man, just stop, you know, over analyzing things, just start somewhere. You know, I think one of the things that that I like to think of is start slow. Um, especially with a blog or a podcast, you know, the examples that we're using, it's really easy to get overwhelmed with all that you should do, but really what you need to do is one thing at a time. Um, and it's just fine to start with like, if you're starting a blog, um, write one article and after that's done, write another. Um, and after a while I would think about the consistency of them. Um, it's really easy and it's a, it's a good practice to kind of borrow from, uh, the news of the world or the media of, um, uh, cadences, right. Uh, but first just prove to yourself that you can actually create that content and put it out there. And after a while, maybe commit to, um, publishing every Monday. And what they'll do is literally kickstart like, oh, if I want to publish next Monday, I better be writing now. And it'll help you to think in that mindset of a proper cadence. Um, and then as you start to nail every single Monday, uh, just add in more days and um, go from there. Yeah. So I've, I've been in internet marketing for a long time and really, I mean, it's called digital marketing now, but back, you know, 
uh, 20 years ago when this was like just getting started. Uh, it was a very wild, wild west type of thing going on and, you know, just weird people were on the internet trying to sell stuff on there, but now it's, it's definitely mainstream. Everyone does it. Right. It, be, yeah, it became, a, it became a lot more normal. Right. But before, yeah, yeah. like you said, it was literally just like this, like when people were doing it, you're like, is this a scam? I don't know. But now this became right. like just a way businesses market. This is normal. Yeah. Right? This is just yeah. what people do now. Some people have it down and they say, you know, we've got this, we're happy with our website copy, we're happy with our product descriptions, but we need to bring this into our email life cycle, or we need to write a new welcome series. Other clients are saying, we know where we've been, and we know where we want to go, but we're not sure how to get there. And so we'll say, where does it make sense to roll out um, more of a distinctive voice? Or where does it make sense to experiment a little bit, uh, especially with humor, because I, I buried the lead a whole lot, but humor is kind of my thing. Uh, and so we'll, we'll figure that out together. Um, but often humor is the best place to start or emails are the best place to start with humor because you're building that one-on-one -on -one relationship in someone's inbox. One example for us that is, um, has had a decent return on it is looking at, uh, you know, everything in your content library and everything in your customer journey, looking at, you know, everything you've got out there and then, you know, sending machine learning algorithms out to determine what are the critical checkpoints and when do they happen? So you can come back with a graph and say, okay, look, so in the average four month buying cycle for this product, we can see that in the first three months, these are the three things that everybody tends to hit. Um, you know, as they cross this threshold here, these one or two marketing programs are the most effective. And then we see the indicators at the end of, you know, these are the ones that are already there when we close. And then you're also able to test you know, uh, okay, so you kind of know which ones are the checkpoints they always hit, uh, which ones are directly correlated to that too. So you can look at certain things and ultimately say, hey, look, if we drive more traffic to, you know, these two or three videos, we know that that will pay out with business over the next four months. Human nature really hasn't changed. And if you can understand uh, persuasion principles, like I talk about in my book, or direct marketing strategies that work back in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s. Uh, they use the same things. It's just a delivery mechanism is different how people are receiving the message. So that's a, a real important message that uh, you hit on that I really d definitely like to share with uh, listeners. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.